Hello again, and welcome to episode four of War Stories, Tales from the Front Lines of the Media, Behind the Scenes. I'm your host, Tom Curley. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, again, we're really happy about how, how well it's going, and uh, it would uh, not be going as well if it, uh, not going as well as it does. I seem to have lost the ability to speak if it wasn't for my partner in crime, Gary Armstrong. How you doing, Gary? Howdy. Howdy, howdy, indeed. So, we've... You know, uh, I, have to, uh, take, I have to take you to task right at the top. I know you're the creator and executive producer of our podcast, but uh, <laughs> this arrangement here with the microphone, this looks like I'm being attacked by a giant mammoth black penis. Yes, yes, and, and it looks like I'm being attacked by a rather slender black penis. Um, well, you know, sometimes stereotypes. <laughs> this could be a, you know, this yeah, could be a Roger yeah. Corbin and Russ Myers. Yeah, yeah. Which which is a story. Speaking of we'll disasters, uh, this is one of those days, and it has our our viewers really won't appreciate this. But um, we've gone. We're both in uh, New England. You're in Connecticut. I'm in Massachusetts. We've gone from 60 degree weather two days ago to it's snowing right now. And yeah. uh, our our audience is uh, one person more. Our dog is running around the studio, so we'll ask the viewers to put up with us. Yeah, or and hopefully the a... giant black penis will mind its manners. Well, you know, it's very interesting when I when I set up these broadcasts uh, and you you post them, and especially the live stream which we're doing right now, I have to click a box that says. Uh, for all audiences or mature. And I always click mature just in case. Well, I'm really glad that I did. <laughs> so I'm glad you like, did too. Yes. Yeah, so, so anyway, a little a little housekeeping. Um, we've been, uh, again, getting a lot of response. We've now gone from, from uh, tens of viewers to many tens of viewers. And we're getting more Amazing. subscribers every week. But we got a really interesting comment this week. And uh, if you remember last week, uh, we talked about celebrities that we met and I talked about meeting Dr. Timothy Leary. And it was very funny. But anyway, the comment I right. got was, I had to look up Timothy Leary. Oh, now I get the joke. So I think we forget <laughs> what, that we take for granted um, that everybody yes. knows who we're talking about. now. Uh, last week it was John Wayne and Lucille Ball. Uh, well, uh, I mean, good Lord, if the kids don't know who they are, I give up. But one of the things I was going to mention last week, and, and I forgot, you talk about uh, celebrities that you were excited to meet. And oddly yeah. enough, uh, in my case, uh, we were doing CBS Market Watch. And our executive producer, Bob Leveroni, we were basically about the same age. And I think the rest of our crew and staff were, were younger. So he comes into the control room one day and he's all excited. He goes, Tom, Tom, you'll never guess who I booked. I said, who? He says, um, Joe Franklin. And I go, <laughs> and I go, Joe Franklin. Holy, sh that's awesome. My God, Joe. And, and then I, the next thing I go is, what the hell does Joe Franklin have to do with a business website? He says, oh, don't I don't, get it. I don't care. We got Joe Franklin. Yeah. So, of course, now, and again, for the people at home that don't know who it is, Joe Franklin was a local TV personality who was on the air for how long? I mean, forever. Oh, I would, has to be 30 or 40 years and on television, New York television, especially. That's, that's amazing. Yes. But uh, he was exactly. a character. He was a Damon oh, Runyon character. He was an amazing character. And he was just, uh, he would just talk a hundred miles an hour and he would have like the most obscure guests you could possibly imagine. And then yeah, yeah. somebody like Elvis Presley. I mean, he, then suddenly he'd have stars. And I think they shot it in his office. Um, because, and it looked like he was a hoarder. I mean, I just remember there was just stacks <laughs> of paper and folders. But anyway, his, his intro was always, you know, and coming up next, one of my greatest friends, old friend, known him forever, just met him a moment ago, Gary Armstrong. Yes. And yes. nobody would notice. So 
when we did the interview, somehow they managed to make it somehow uh, business related. Um, so the, the anchor asked him, he said, well, what's the secret uh, to success in, in entertainment, in show business? And he said, without missing a beat, sincerity. Once you can fake that, you can do anything. <laughs> I was just like, you just, and you just. That, yeah. that was Joe Franklin. That was uh, Joe you know, Franklin. I, when, he, when he said that he had known me for many years, even I blinked. I mean, we all like to uh, gild the lily a little bit, as we say, which is telling not something that's not true. But when he said, I've known this kid for, for, for years and he's got a bright future, I thought, oh, my goodness, he has known me for many years. And, and he segued, as we, we mentioned from time to time, he segued from saying he knew Gary Armstrong to having known Barbara Streisand as she was doing Funny Girl. And then he lapsed into, but you know, when, when she did the, the show and when I talked to her, she wasn't using deodorant. And this is on live television. What do you do with that? <laughs> exactly. It's amazing. Exactly. So, um, other uh, piece of uh, housekeeping before we uh, uh, start today's uh, silliness. I've noticed uh, watching the show back that if people are watching, they see me uh, looking over here, looking down, reaching. Um, what you have to understand is that most shows have a, a behind the scenes uh, crew, a technical director who switches the cameras and an audio guy who moves the mixer well we don't we have this is the actual control room yes this is what's going on i have to do everything uh what you're looking at there is is the actual switcher that's exactly what a switcher would look like in a television studio because it is a television switcher so anyway just just so you know when you see me looking around um uh that's what's going on I'm not ignoring you. I'm trying to get the. Uh, I'm trying to get the next shot. I, I get it. I, I. I. I am still amazed. Now, I. I obviously, I saw what you did when we visited you uh, a few months ago, and I was bowled over about how you are one of those people who has said, "I'm going to make my basement something special," and it's not something that's really bizarre. It's really creative. Well, I. I, I appreciate it. It is ironic because. Uh, I was one of the first people, I was an experiment at CBS back in the early 90s. Uh, CBS, uh, basically in an attempt to get even cheaper, uh, created a show called Up to the Minute, and we'll do many shows about that later on. But the concept was we were going to build a studio that could be used, uh, could be run by two people instead of a crew of 18 which is the way it normally is. It was considered a, um, an experiment, and I was then made what they call a hyphenate. Uh, I was a director, but I was also the technical director. I was also the audio guy. I was also the cameraman. I was also the Chiron operator. Um, Jack of all trades. Yeah, and the old joke was, uh, well, why don't you just be on camera too? And, well, that wasn't possible because the camera was in – a studio. But I suddenly realized that, well, here we finally come full circle. I'm doing it all. Anyway, so the uh, opening of the show uh, gives the impression that uh, there are disasters going on behind the camera and in front of the oh, camera. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And we've each got a couple. And I want to start off with yours. Um, and it involves you were doing a stand up uh, on a river. Anyway, I was I was doing a uh, it's all yours. a live shot. We were having uh, extensive flooding in Massachusetts, especially uh, uh, the northern part of the state near the New Hampshire uh, line. Uh, I was uh, I was set up for the live shot uh, on the shore of the Concord River, and it was uh, it was obviously the, the the river was obviously overflowing. And I just started to set the scene for the audience, and I wanted to give them a closer view because even though you think in your mind's eye as you, you see what's, what's happening from your vantage point, it's not always clear that the viewer is getting the full impact of, uh, uh, we'll call it devastation here. So I thought I would get uh, next to the river so that the camera could look over my shoulder and give the audience, you know, the, 
the real bird's eye view of, of what the water was doing. Very quickly, I want to show you, looking over in that direction, you can see how the water is now reaching back and flooding the back door, flooding the backyard. It is all underwater here now. And I'm going to make my way back across what used to be the backyard. This is all mud and guck and water. So I, I, uh, I had all my storm gear on, and I thought uh, the worst that could happen is I would uh, perhaps go, to, go into my knees, and it would still look like a good shot. Well, I kept talking, or jabbering, as we like to say, about how, how swollen the river was. And I kept walking closer and closer. And there was a part of my brain that said this is the, 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 uh, the footing was getting softer, which meant I was getting closer to the water. Now, my crew didn't say anything. I kept talking about how swollen the river was. And all of a sudden, I found myself in the river. I had walked into the river. And I think as I emerged from the water, from the river, I said something like, oh, my goodness, I think I just walked into the river. Now I can hear the crew laughing and I walked out of the river like Lloyd Bridges and Sea Hunt and water was just cascading off of me and I just kept jabbering and I looked at myself and I said something like holy heck and I just walked off camera and I could hear the crew applauding and in my IFB I could hear people laughing at me. So literally that was the live shot that saw me really become part of the story walking into the river submerging into the river, rising from the river, or walking away, never missing a beat. I, 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 and as I walked off camera and the mic was still hot, I started to say something like, I, I cut myself off in time. Someone nearby was nice enough to get me some dry clothing, but I was soaked to my skin. Talk about disasters that uh, went well. We found out later that the uh, the show, because of what was happening, and by the way, Marilyn, my wife, and oh, and her son, my stepson, but that's another story, they were watching all of this. And apparently they were laying odds that I, Gary, who never stopped for anything, would walk into the water. And God bless them, they were right. So, you, you know that, what this makes me think of, Tom? Yeah. Is yeah. that live shots are so unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen. Oh, and absolutely. that's why I love the, the excitement of them. Yes. You can't yes. prepare yourself really. Right. Well, I, I, the, the, one of the things that we do have in common is that our careers involve live. Everything was live. Um, every show I worked on, with rare exception, was live. I calculated once. We've easily done 20, maybe 30,000 hours of live TV. I mean, just take doing the morning news for 10 years. That's two hours a day, five days a week. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and what I always found amazing is that live puts everybody, they, you get, they, you're, you're, you're focused, you're, you're, you're in the moment. Absolutely. And I was, always, I was always amazed that every day on the morning news, we would do a two hour live show with no problem. We would get on exactly at seven, we would get off exactly at nine, and then we would spend the next hour recording a 10 second promo for the next day. And I used to sit- That's amazing. I used to sit in the, I was doing audio at that time, and I would sit and go like, how is this possible? Well, when you're not live, you can do it again and again and again. And it's a again. different mindset. It's a different mindset. And then, and then, of course, it's a lot of time it's the talent. And as a director, we would tape something. And I go, that's good, because it was good. And yeah. oh, well, let me do it. Let me do it just one more time. And uh, it, yeah, that was that was good too. Uh, thirty-four take, thirty-four takes later, um, we end up taking the first one because you always end up taking the first one. So because that was each retake is less fresh. It's less fresh yes. and 34 takes later, it's really very stale. Exactly, and exactly. The thing about live is you feel as if you're challenged. You are being challenged. Uh, you don't mm -hmm. have time to stop and think, this is how I should say it. This is how I should do it. You just mm -hmm. do it. You, and you're, and if, you're, if you're lucky, and I would, over the course of my career, I was lucky enough times to have that career, but you're, you're always challenged to just see it 
and do it. <laughs> and that's that's at the heart of most of these stories. You're not thinking, you're just doing it. You well, must that's... have gone through similar experiences. Oh, absolutely. Which uh, leads us to uh, my my story. This was a behind the scenes disaster. This took place in, uh, I would say, 1980. All right. And uh, there was a, a famous hostage crisis. Um, I think it was a TWA flight that uh, was taken hostage by Muslim terrorists, Arab terrorists. And it was on a runway in Lebanon. And it lasted for, I think, more than a week. I mean, a long time. Matter of fact, uh, here's a picture of it. That's the pilot. And that's the terrorist. That was a very famous uh, photo of the time. So we had developed um, uh, special events would, of course, flash on. But we were flashing on a lot. And I mean a lot. Uh, so much so that we had basically commandeered one of the control rooms. Um, I don't think it might have been the old Walter Cronkite control room, but I'm not sure. But anyway, it was one of the old control rooms and it had a rather right. small audio booth. <clears throat> and right next to uh, the audio booth, there was a, a window. And that's where the, the actual video part of the control room were all the executives and the producers and the directors and the ADs. And the you know the the lighting director that's where that's right. where they sat, okay. So, the executive producer, uh, literally just by luck, happened to be sitting, literally next to the window that led into the audio booth. So all she had to do was just go, "Hey, do this." All right. So, right. the audio guy at the time, um, I <laughs> was a guy named Marty Stein. And, uh, and we'd like to welcome Duke to the show. Um, so Artie had this, and I was his uh, assistant. I was his A2. So my job was basically to put out fires. In other words, if there was a problem, right. the guy sitting at the board, he can't, he can't do anything because he's sitting at the board and he's mixing the show. So the assistant's job is to fix whatever the problem is. But Artie had this thing where... This crisis went on so long that he started bringing in more and more audio equipment. And, and, he, and he loved to have things that were shiny and bright and made beeping noise. Dressing it or up. Had, dressing it up because when the suits came by, they would look in and they go, Ooh, wow, boy, he's, he's doing a good job. He has the machine that, that blinks. So right. it got to the point after a week where... The audio booth looked like somebody threw a hang somebody threw a hand grenade into uh, <laughs> into a nobody beats the into a Best Buy. All right, there was just equipment everywhere, and and none of it was hooked up, none of it. Okay, so we finished one of our many 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 flash ons, and it happened to be Sunday. Okay, and it was just before Face the Nation, which at that time just happened to be hosted by Leslie Stahl. And we had, there was this uh, head terrorist, his name was Nobby Barry. And we had a phone call to this guy and he was the person that all the press were talking to. He was the official press liaison to the terrorist. Right. Wow. So it turns out that we had made the initial phone call. Now, you might not know, but back then, making an overseas phone call was not as easy as it is today. So we right. got the phone call to this guy, and we were afraid to hang up. So what we did instead is we had a little typewriter table, and we set up a bunch of distribution amplifiers, which are just, you can put one audio source in and get eight or ten audio sources out. And we were feeding this to all the other networks, to ABC, to NBC, to, uh, uh, to, to, to the local networks. And we were like the hub, okay? So it was our right. little studio with our phone off the hook. So we did the flash on, and now Leslie Stahl is interviewing this Nobby Berry, okay? And it's on in the background. Yeah. So we finished the flash on, and Artie goes, you know, 
I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear the executive producer uh, talking to me. And I said, tell her to turn her head to the right and speak up. Said, no, no, I want you to get out of the crib. And I want you to get a microphone. And I want you to get a separate amplifier and a speaker. And I went, no, no, I'm not doing it. Right. So I said, all right, it, it, it looks like somebody threw a hand grenade. Well, back then I would have said, nobody beats the whiz. And I said, I'm right. not doing it. That's it. And I walked away. So a few minutes later, I see another of our, our audio guys. Uh, uh, great guy. His name is Evan Davies. He's Jamaican. Just the sweetest guy you ever wanted to know. And he's mm -hmm. coming down the hallway, and he's got a cart filled with amplifiers and speakers and microphones. <laughs> and I just sit back and I go, I go, I want nothing to do with what this. The heck? Right? What the heck? So... We're all just sitting in the control room waiting while Face the Nation is on. And Evan is now on the floor and he's trying to plug in the amplifier, but there are no outlets available. So what he needed was what we called back then a, a two-way. It was basically a plug that had two, a Y plug so that you could plug yeah. two things into one outlet. Well, fate, who has a sense of humor, put, of course. A, put a Y plug in front of him. And it was, it was what he needed, but it had a little piece of red tape wrapped around it. Okay, now, the red tape was something that Art had put on because it had a dead short in it and it wasn't usable. So he put a piece of red tape around it to, to, to show that, except that except that he didn't tell anybody and he didn't throw it away. He just threw it on the floor <laughs> where fate put it in Evan's hands. He plugged that thing in and I am not making I'm this waiting. up. A plume of blue electricity exploded out of the socket. Evan goes, ah, and he jumps up. He happened to be underneath the typewriter table that had all the equipment that was feeding the phone call oh to the goodness. whole world and everything goes dark. The whole studio, the whole control, dark. You can't see the hand in front of your face. All hell breaks loose. In the control room, people are falling over each other. The TD literally jumps <laughs> over the console to find the circuit breakers to turn the thing back on. This goes on for about, oh, a good 15, 20 seconds. And then the lights come Incredible. back on and there are literally Incredible. people entangled with each other. I, <laughs> I, am, I am on the floor in the fetal position. I am laughing so hard and in, <laughs> and, and off in the background, off over a little speaker, you hear Leslie Stahl going, we, we seem to have lost our connection to Mr. Bear. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, let's say there was, there was, uh, so, so about a week later, that's, incredible. My, that's aggressive. So about a week later, my boss comes by and he goes, I've been in meetings every day for the last week. Could you just tell me, could you just tell me what, what actually happened? And I said, yeah, none of this would have happened if uh, he had just told the executive producer to turn her head to the right and speak up. And he goes, oh, he goes, oh my God, you're, you're right. Yeah. True story actually happened. All right. Your turn. That, that, that's. I, I believe it. I believe it. Uh, was Leslie at all aware of what was going on, or was she oblivious oh, no. to the oh, chaos? Oh no, no, she was. She was in Washington. I mean, this was all she knew. She was in the studio in Washington, and the 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 remote was coming in her ear. Uh, she could hear him. He yeah. could hear them. That's all you need. I mean, she's got other things to worry about. So no, she never knew. So, uh, oh, quickly, quickly, uh, we've done it again. Yeah, um, but I don't. Course. I don't care. We're going to get to it. My one of. My favorite all-time stories of you involves the fact that you're Samoan. And uh, we've only got a few minutes left, but we got a button with that story. Take it away. Okay, this, and this, again, we keep saying you can't make this stuff up. This is, uh, this is the early to the mid-70s. Uh, Boston is still embroiled in racial desegregation in the schools. 
uh, the fans of racism or plaguing the city. I am uh, in an area of South Boston, I believe, and I was wrapping up. We were shooting film still. We hadn't gone to uh, videotape. So we were, ha- we were wrapping up the story, and I realized I was getting close to airtime. And because we were using film in the back of my mind, and you know what priorities are, in the back of my mind was we had to drive the film back to the station, bring it into the lab. The film had to be souped, processed. After that, the film had to be edited. And that meant a half an hour for the film to be souped, another X amount of minutes for the film to be edited before it would be ready for someone to rush it into the control room. All of that was going through my mind as the crew was wrapping up the gear and... I see coming over the horizon towards me a group of people. I also see that they're they're carrying bats and uh, lead pipes and things. And I begin to notice because I had a headset on, I couldn't quite hear what they were saying. So I ripped the headset off and they're yelling racial epithets at me. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that these people were not happy with me. Not me personally, I didn't think, but they were happy with the fact that I was reporting on... uh, anti-busing, anti-racial integration uh, things. I knew this was trouble. My mind then clocked again and said, we've got to get out of here, not because of any fear from the crowd, but the clock was ticking on getting the film back. That's your uh, priority. They kept coming closer and closer. I looked at my crew, and the crew was aware of the danger, the imminent danger. And I said, not to worry, I'll take care of it. Finally, they're within hearing distance. Uh, You could see the foam in their mouth. You could see they were really angry. And I was thinking, what could I say? Now, I'm hearing them yelling these ugly things at me, including the N-word, many, many times. And I was thinking, oh, this is going to be dangerous. What can I do? What can I say? And my crew now was getting very edgy. One of them said, we need to get the heck out of here, except he didn't say heck. Now, I'm getting close to them close enough so that they could physically do uh, bodily harm to me. And out of the back of my head, I don't know why, where it came from, as I heard them saying, you dirty, and I I flashed this thing, and this is like a, a Mel Brooks uh, scenario, but this was before Mel Brooks and Blazing Saddles. I said to them, wait a minute, wait a minute. And as I held my hands up like Charlton Heston, or Mel Brooks as Charlton Heston, I waved my hands and held my hands up, and they, they stopped. They stopped in my movement, and they just stared at me. And I, I looked at them, and I said the magic words. I said, I am not a nigger. I'm a Samoan. Don't you get it? I'm a Samoan. And their faces went blank. My crew looked at me. I looked at my crew. My crew started snickering. I looked back at the angry crowd, and they clearly were taken with me. And someone said, hey, wait a minute. He's not a nigger. He's a Samoan. He's okay. He's great. He's a Samoan. And then I thought, my gosh, these people are really stupid. And the crew started laughing. We, we bolted to our cars, and they were actually, the, the angry mob was now willing to help us carry the gate of the car, saying, I didn't know you were Samoan. You don't look Samoan, but come to think of it, maybe you are. And I said, no doubt about it. Just look at me. Look at my skin color. I'm a Samoan. Okay. Okay. We're sorry. And we put the gear in the car, got in the car, and we started heading home. The assignment editor is saying, Gary, why are you in the car? I said, because we're bringing the film in. We're trying to make the deadline. He said, no, Gary, you've been seriously injured. You're in the hospital, aren't you? I said, no, I'm fine. I didn't even mention the Samoan story to the assignment editor. And I said, why do you think I'm in the hospital? He said, well, the all news station is broadcasting that you've been pummeled by that angry mob. And you're in bad shape. And I said, but I'm not. I'm in the car. I'm coming home. No, you're not, Gary. The radio says you've been pummeled and you're in bad shape. We'll send another crew to take care of you. Well, that was the end of that conversation because we clicked off the two-way, drove back to the station, and people were so startled to see me not being pummeled by the angry mob. And because they had started to run a headline that one of their reporters had been beaten up in a racial incident. Then I told them the Samoan story, and the newsroom just broke up into laughter. And to this day, to this day, uh, 50 years later, there are many people in Boston who will swear that I am a Samoan.
There you go. So we've done it again. We have done it again. We have run out of time. Uh, I, I just never <laughs> cease to be amazed how, how quickly it goes. And, and what you just said has actually given me, a, reminded me of another uh, disaster story that we will get to in the next week's episode. So anyway, I'd like okay. to thank you. And of course, we have to do the plugs now. Uh, of course, uh, my, our sister podcast, my sister podcast, Get Off My Lawn uh, with Tom Curley. <laughs> And, of course, we have to promote uh, yours, uh, Marilyn's, and our blog, Serendipity, Seeking Intelligent Life on Earth. Um, it's very, it's like pushing a rock up a hill, but we are still looking. So, anyway, uh, Gary, uh, we did it again. What can I tell you? Uh, really, It's really been great once it. again. I mean, It's been great. It, it, so, we will see you next week. Thank you all. Okay, and, buddy. And um, ta-ta. Ta-ta.